So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker, Dr. Emily Miller Cushion is an assistant professor in the Department of Animal Sciences at the University of Florida. She obtained her PhD from Guelph, University of Guelph in 2014, and her research program now focuses on understanding behavioral development in dairy calves, with the aim of refining our rearing practices to improve welfare. Dr. Miller Cushion's research program is funded through both federal and industry support. She has over 33, I think 33 peer reviewed papers, three book chapters, and in 2019, she received the International Society for Applied Ecology New Investigator Award. So we really appreciate her taking the time to talk today. She has an active teaching program, both undergrads and grad level instruction. And uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction um, and for the opportunity to participate in today's virtual dairy nutrition and management series. So calf feeding and housing has seen a lot of changes, as we know, on many farms in the past decade or so. This is a picture of our facility at the University of Florida Dairy Research Unit. And you can see that there's a lot going on for these calves to do. They can feed when they choose from the automated milk feeder you can see in the back left. They have space, social contact. We have other things for them to do as well. For example, the rotating brush you can see in the back right-hand corner. So a large focus of my research program has been understanding what effects these aspects of management have on calf development and welfare. For this presentation, I'd like to briefly discuss some different key aspects of management that influence calf behavior and discuss what the consequences of not accommodating these needs might be for calf welfare. So the three areas I'll go over are aspects of feeding, social contact, uh, and then more briefly, other resources we can provide calves that affect their behavior. At the end of the presentation, I'll take a few minutes to discuss more broadly why it's important to provide opportunities for behavioral expression in calves. So to start off, uh, there are a lot of things we could discuss as far as nutrition and feeding for calves, but I'm going to just briefly discuss some main points. So milk feeding, weaning considerations, and aspects of solid feed provision. So first, there's been a lot of interest in short and long-term effects of milk feeding level for calf performance. So there are two general approaches. First, uh, conventional feeding where calves receive a restricted milk allowance of about 10% of their body weight in milk or milk replacers. So this equates to about four or six liters per day held constant over the feeding stage. And in contrast, um, it's becoming more common to give calves more milk so-called intensified or accelerated milk feeding programs where calves receive, say anything over eight liters per day up to free access um, to milk. To illustrate milk intake at either ends of the spectrum, this is some data comparing milk intake in liters per day of calves on a typical restricted milk feeding plan, five liters per day, uh, the study, which was held constant over the milk feeding period, this line is shown in orange. We can see that within a couple days of age, calves were finishing their entire milk allotment. And in contrast, um, we can see the intake of calves provided free access to milk. Um, by the end of the first week of age, they were consuming about double that of the calves on the restricted milk feeding plan. And in this study, their intake peaked around 16 liters per day. So obviously these different milk intakes have big effects on calf growth and behavior. And we can see here how these different milk feeding plans influence feeding time. So this is showing a 24 hour um, snapshot of how much time calves spent consuming milk by hour. With calves with the free access to milk, uh, they had their milk delivered at 8 a.m. And we can see there's a, a peak in feeding time here, but then they continue to feed for nearly every hour of the day for at least a few minutes. And they had about seven to eight meals per day on this free access to milk. In contrast, calves on the restricted milk feeding plan, they received their milk at 8 a.m. and 4 p.m., so they spent a few minutes feeding at these times, and then they weren't able to feed for the rest of the day. So clearly, um, these different restricted milk allowances are resulting in calves spending much less time feeding over the course of the day, and they're feeding less frequently, and we have evidence that they're hungry. So I've added to this graph a dashed orange line. Uh, so this is showing 
how much time the calves on the restricted milk feeding plan spent sucking on the teat after they had finished their milk. So unrewarded sucking time. And we can actually see that at 8 a.m. and 4 p.m., they spent more time sucking on the teat after the milk was gone than they actually spent consuming their milk. And they also spent some time sucking on this teat at other times in the day as well. So this indicator of hunger depends on milk feeding method. So in this study, we left the teat in the pan after they'd finished their milk. Um, and we know that um, apart from milk feeding allowance, the aspect of, of how calves are fed milk is also important. Calves are motivated to suck. And we see that um, unrewarded sucking or pen-directed sucking or cross-sucking are reduced by providing milk via a tea instead of by bucket. So it's not just the milk volume that matters, it's also feeding method. And we have other indicators of hunger as well. So in addition to the unrewarded sucking shown in the previous graph, we also see things like pen-directed sucking shown in the picture here, um, and as well as other changes in behavior. So calves that are provided more milk spend more time playing and more time resting, and have fewer vocalizations. So in addition to performance and growth benefits of providing more milk, um, we also see clear effects on calf welfare of higher milk allowances. So we see the benefits of providing access to milk, but we have to be careful about how we wean these calves to encourage solid feed intake. So it's, it's well known that calves that receive more milk are spending less time, less consuming less starter prior to weaning. And this can result in delayed rumen development and a reduced ability to digest nutrients. So for example, we can see differences in concentrate intake here in calves with free access to milk shown in blue, or calves on that restricted milk feeding plan of five liters a day. So when we give calves less milk, the five liters a day here, they're eating a lot more starter, whereas the calves that had free access to milk are consuming hardly any starter until we start reducing milk, at which point they have to increase starter quite quickly. So this is a pretty abrupt transition and it can result in a plateau in weight gain, which we saw in this study. So those calves were weighing more coming into weaning and they maintained a body weight advantage post weaning as well, but this was a, a rough transition through the weaning period for them. So how do we ease this transition through weaning for calves provided more milk? So first, importantly, we need to have a long enough step down period of about two to three weeks from peak milk intake to encourage solid feed intake before milk is removed. So in the data shown on the previous slide, we just didn't wean the calves gradually enough from the really high milk allowance. Second, we can wean calves later. So for example, calves weaned at eight weeks compared to six weeks of age are already consuming more solid feed and typically have an easier time weaning off of milk. Um, the other thing to think about, so most approaches for management are based on the needs of the average calf, but we know that calves are widely variable in how much they eat early in life. And there's been some interesting work in recent years showing that it can be beneficial to wean calves based on their individual starter intake rather than by age. And this is something that is becoming feasible with the use of technology, like automated milk and starter feeders, which monitor individual intake. And these give us a way to sort of accommodate those needs of the individual calf. We know how important it is uh, that calves consume starter during the pre-weaning period, um, but there's also been some consideration of other aspects of a solid feed program for calves, such as forage provision. Um, in, in my lab, we have been looking at uh, the effects of providing calves with chopped hay and how it affects their behavior and growth. Um, there, there's some variability in the results from different groups. Um, effects of hay provision can depend on the type of hay provided and the start type of starter provided. But evidence suggests that hay provision can increase total solid feed intake and can improve rumen environment, such as increasing rumen pH. We've also seen that providing calves access to hay reduces non-nutritive oral behavior, like pen-directed sucking. This is an example of some data looking at group house calves provided hay. Um, this graph is showing this, in, uh, this line in green, or calves are provided uh, starter only, shown in orange. So in this study, starter intake didn't differ, um, but we saw that calves provided hay in addition to starter consumed more solid feed total over the first four weeks of the pre-weaning period.
So the opportunity to eat hay also influences feeding time, not too surprisingly. So here we're looking at the feeding time in minutes per hour, and this is for both starter and hay combined. We provided the calves with fresh feed at 7 a.m. where there is a peak in feeding time. But then we saw that for nearly every hour following this observation period, the calves provided hay were spending more time eating. So when we consider how forage provision also can reduce pen-directed sucking or other non-nutritive oral behaviors, I think this suggests to us that forage provision really satisfies a need to manipulate and ingest forage, and it gives calves something to do, since we know how active calves can be and how interested in looking and exploring their environment they are. Next, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about social housing um, and aspects of, of social dynamics within uh, pens of calves. So this has been an area of a lot of interest in the last couple of years. Um, we know that there is evidence across species of benefits of social contact for behavioral development, um, and there are consequences associated with social isolation. Uh, these include um, development of abnormal behaviors, long-term differences in ability to cope with stressors, and cognitive or learning impairments. In dairy calves, we see that calves um, that are housed individually are will work for access to a social companion, and they choose to spend time with familiar pen mates and they prefer to feed socially. So we see evidence of this preference and motivation to spend time with other animals. And we see benefits of housing calves in groups. So for example, group housed calves are less fearful and reactive in novel situations. And we see potential long-term benefits of early social contact and social ability of, of the calves even after weaning. We also see that social contact encourages early feeding behaviors, resulting in more frequent meals. This is some data showing solid feed intake as a percentage of body weight over the pre-weaning period for calves that were housed in pairs, which is the line shown in green, or calves that were housed individually in the line shown in purple. We can see that uh, pair housed calves consuming more starter, uh, particularly right before weaning around week seven of age, and these calves also had improved weight gain through weaning. So this effect of social contact on solid feed intake has been seen many times, um, and it's particularly important when we think about um, calves receiving more milk, since they are consuming uh, less solid feed before weaning. So providing social contact in that scenario can help uh, solve that issue of weaning those calves from higher milk allowances. There are lots of different management factors that are really critical to the success of group housed calves. Um, like environmental aspects like cleanliness, uh, space allowance, ventilation, and, and these are all really important to consider for the health of group housed calves. But uh, one, one thing that I wanted to talk about from a behavioral perspective is competition for access to milk. Because we see that calves would often prefer to feed together, competition can become a factor. And we see some different effects of increasing the number of calves per feeding space or feeder. Uh, like greater rates of intake, uh, longer wait times for access to the feeder, uh, more frequent displacements or competitive disturbances for access to milk. And we also see the potential for reduced milk intake, although this likely depends on um, the, the system and the feeding level the calves are, are on. We have seen um, effects of competition for access to teats for intake in pair house calves. This was some data from a study where we housed calves in pairs either with one teat, so competitive milk feeding, or two teats, so presumably less competitive milk feeding, and milk supply was unlimited. So this graph is showing milk intake per calf over the seven weeks of the milk feeding period. And we can see that in the early weeks of life, pairs of calves provided a single teat, which is shown in orange, were consuming less milk and then compensated for this by consuming more milk in the later weeks of the milk feeding stage. So this might suggest that competition probably affects younger, weaker calves more dramatically. Um, and unfortunately, this shift in milk intake is exactly what we don't want to see um, because it's important for calves to be consuming more milk earlier in life, but then we want them to start eating more solid feed to make weaning a little bit easier for them. Um, with, with all aspects of early management, it's important to consider how these effects might, uh, factors might affect behavior over time. And competition is one case where we have seen some 
dramatic effects of early experience on later behavior. This is uh, an example where we're showing the frequency of displacements for feed in weaned paired calves that had been fed competitively um, with the single teat prior to weaning in orange or were fed non-competitively with two teats in blue. So after weaning, despite not having to compete for a feeding place because we gave the pairs of calves two buckets, we did see that calves that had experienced competition for their milk prior to weaning were much more likely to displace their pen mate. So this might show us the importance of considering how early life experience influences the calf uh, longer term um, beyond just the direct effects on performance that we see uh, during the pre-weaning period. So in addition to these major topics of um, feeding management and social housing, I wanted to briefly discuss how other resources in the environment can provide opportunities for uh, behavioral expression. So particularly something that we've been looking at in the last couple of years in my lab um, is the opportunity for grooming and brush use. So this is an example of the behavior of a single calf during a one hour period of observation. So this is from 4.20 to 5.20 p.m. And we were looking at um, different types of grooming behaviors. So we looked at brush use, and that's shown in yellow on the graph, and there was use of, the, uh, of a rotating brush like shown in the picture. We also looked at social grooming, which is shown in blue, and we looked at self-grooming, which is shown in green. So what's interesting about this is that for nearly the entire one hour period of observation, the calf was occupied entirely with different types of grooming behaviors. And this is representative, it's something that varies over the course of the day, but this calf wasn't unusual. So we don't necessarily spend a lot of time thinking about grooming behaviors in calves, but I think it's important to understand them because they clearly occupy a certain amount of time. And we also see a lot of individual variability in brush use in some of these grooming behaviors. So it might be important to think about providing some of these resources because they might accommodate some individual preferences in calves. We also see some different interesting effects of providing calves with brushes. And one of them um, that we've seen is that provision of the brush can actually increase self-grooming as well. So it seems to be stimulating other types of grooming behavior. Um, and in this study, we also saw that it improved coat cleanliness. In addition to those rotating brushes, we've also looked at the use of manual brushes in calves. So this is an example of a manual brush we gave individually housed calves. These are just simple scrub brushes um, attached to the side of the individual pen. So a pretty cheap thing to provide. And we did see that calves used these brushes for maybe about 20 minutes a day, so a little bit less than the rotating brush. But one interesting thing we saw with these brushes in a recent study was that providing the calves with a brush actually reduced non-retrieve oral behavior. So this graph is showing um, the non-nutritive oral behavior we saw calves doing most was pen-directed sucking. Um, and we followed them for 12 hour observation periods from this graph is showing from 6 a.m. or through to um, 8 p.m. when the observation period finished. So we're looking at how much time per hour calves spent engaged in any type of non-nutritive oral behavior in pens without the brush shown in orange or pens that did have the brush shown in blue. So the first thing to note here is that this effect of brush provision on performance of non of oral behavior um, was particularly noticeable around feeding. So milk was delivered at 6 a.m. and 3 p.m. And these are the time points when calves are typically more active and more likely to engage in non of oral behavior. But we saw here that the provision of the brush reduced non of oral behavior. So this could suggest an, oppor an opportunity um, to perform grooming behavior might reduce boredom or frustration at these time points. It might provide an outlet for calves to do something while they're active after eating. Um, and we also saw that those calves with the brush lay down more quickly after feeding, whereas the calves with the brush spent more time standing, so were perhaps more active. Another thing to note from this graph is just how much time calves spent performing these non oral behaviors. So the behavior in this graph, this adds up to about 40 to 60 minutes over this 12 hour observation period. So the calves spent a lot of time engaging these behaviors. So I think it's important to think about giving them something to do during these times of the day when they're particularly active, in addition to focusing on feeding aspects and, and social housing.
Okay, so we've talked about how expression of, of some of these different behaviors is related to calf welfare, um, such as how milk feeding affects hunger um, and effects of hay access and brush provision on unachieved oral behaviors. I, I wanted to spend a few minutes at the end of this talk discussing more generally why opportunities for behavior, uh, expression of behaviors in calves matters um, beyond some of the specific issues associated with different aspects of feeding or housing that we've already discussed. So two important points on this topic. One is that giving calves more to do makes it easier to understand how they are feeling. And the second is that by giving calves more to do early in life, we are likely improving their lifelong welfare. So when calves have more opportunities for behavioral expression, we have more ways to use behavior as an indicator of welfare. And I'll give some examples related to disease and pain on this topic, since these are two negative states that we want to reduce and we often rely on behavior to tell us something about. So first, disease. Um, changes in calf behavior can be useful indicators of disease. And some of these have been well studied, uh, like changes in activity and aspects of feeding behavior, um, particularly feeding behavior that can be detected using an automated milk feeder. Uh, so for example, disease is associated with um, reduced drinking speed. Um, calves will have less frequent visits to the auto feeder when they're sick. Um, and sometimes calves will have reduced intake and feeding time, um, but typically only when milk allowance is higher. We've also seen some changes in behavior in group housed calves, uh, like reduced grooming time and reduced social interaction. So this might suggest that opportunities for more to do in group housed calves might provide us with some additional indicators of disease. And this is an example of a study where we used an experimental disease challenge um, it was a respiratory pathogen. And we're looking at the frequency of social lying events on the number per hour of healthy calves or the sick pen mates that received this disease challenge. And particularly for the first 24 hours after the challenge, we saw that those sick calves were less likely to be lying down near another calf. And we don't really know if this was initiated by the sick calf that wanted to be alone or by pen mates that were avoiding it. But either way, it's suggesting that changes in social behavior that we see in group housed calves might be a way to understand more about um, whether or not they're sick. So another example, um, there's been a lot of work looking at behavioral indicators of pain. So for example, disbutting in calves is associated with uh, changes in activity and wound-directed behavior. Um, in my lab, we have been interested recently in how changes in social behavior might be uh, associated with pain. We know that calves are motivated for social contact, but there might still be times when they prefer to be alone. So for example, humans experiencing chronic pain will sometimes exhibit social withdrawal. So we looked at this in group housed calves by providing them with a shelter that allowed for some visual and physical separation from the rest of the pen. This is shown in the picture on the left. And we saw that following disbudding, calves used it more. So this was a period of three days following disbudding and comparing the disbudded calves with their pen mates that were just handled. So this requires a little bit more investigation, um, but it gives us some preliminary evidence that calves experiencing pain may alter how they're using the pen or how they're interacting with their pen mates. And these behavioral changes um, could be potential indicators of pain that we can see in group housed calves, um, or especially in group housed calves that are in more sort of physically complex environments. So finally, why does the opportunity for, for different behavioral expression matter for, for long-term welfare? So there is evidence across species that early life experience affects behavioral development, including the development of natural feeding and social behaviors, as well as the development of abnormal behavior, like the pen-directed sucking and non retrieved sucking that we see in calves. Um, and we also see evidence in other species of how environmental complexity affect, affects brain development, and learning ability. Um, and there's been some recent investigation of how management factors affect cognition in calves. So for example, socially housed calves perform better in learning tasks. And in my lab, we have some evidence to suggest that feeding factors might affect learning ability as well, like provision of hay or provision of milk via tea. So learning ability whether it matters for welfare, we can, we can think about this, particularly um, when dairy cattle are exposed to something new or changing. So dairy heifers 
experience a lot of transitions as they develop. Um, they're introduced to new social groups, they're moved to new diets, um, they might have new housing when they enter a free stall, or they're introduced to the milking parlor. So their ability to cope with these changes is going to impact the performance and welfare at these time points. So as an example of this, um, we have seen that calves have performed better in a learning task adapted more easily to a novel environment. So in this study, we looked at learning ability during the pre-weaning period. We looked at uh, testing calves using a spatial task. So just briefly, they were put into um, a T-shaped test arena with, that had a milk bottle reward on one side. And the calf first had to learn what side to go to to get the milk reward. And then once they had learned that, the location of the reward was switched. So essentially to pass this learning task, the calf had to learn to go directly to the new location of the reward. So then after weaning, calves are moved out onto pasture, which is just part of the standard um, management procedure at our dairy unit. And once they're out on pasture, they had a novel social group and a much larger space. And we released calves in this pasture at the back of the pasture pen, which is the area shown in blue in this little schematic. Um, and we looked at how much time the calves spent exploring different regions of the pen and how long it took them to begin eating from the feed bunk which was at the front section of the pen, which is the area shown in orange in this little picture. So we looked at how learning ability during the pre-weaning period, um, and specifically this ability to relearn the task, um, whether that was predictive of their behavior after grouping. So first, calves that passed the learning task spent relatively little time at the back of the pen, and they tended to be up at the front eating more quickly. But in contrast, calves that failed the learning task spent more time at the back of the pasture, were slower to explore, and took longer to begin eating. So we can see that the early learning ability of these calves might be really important to uh, support that because it's going to impact their ability to adapt to a novel environment throughout their life. Um, and it's something we can influence by aspect of early management. So some key take home messages. Um, first, um, as far as milk feeding, we see that providing cows with more milk reduces their hunger and accommodates natural feeding behavior and has lasting performance benefits, especially if calves are weaned gradually. We see broad benefits of social housing for welfare and performance. Um, I talked about non of oral behaviors like pen directed sucking through this talk. Um, so we see that these are affected by feeding program like milk feeding level and feeding method, um, as well as access to forage. But we also think they might depend on opportunities for other things to do, like use a brush. One of the reasons why providing calves with more to do is important is because this provides us with more behavioral indicators of how the calf is feeling, like whether they're in pain or sick. And then finally, early life uh, environmental complexity has long-term welfare benefits, um, affecting behavioral and cognitive development uh, and likely improving the ability of the calf to cope with management changes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emily. It was really great. Um, while we're switching over to Kyle, um, if you don't mind responding, we had a question or a couple questions related to hay versus chop straw. And I think there's some curiosity if, if there's any research into substituting chop straw for hay in those calves. And also when they do eat that extra dry matter intake and that um, hay starter combination, is that extra intake correlated at all to body weight gain in the data that you have? Yeah, that's a good question. So there has been some work looking at comparing straw and hay with similar effects, um, although there, there are considerable differences in different types of hay provided. So I think it's hard to make any good recommendation other than experiment and make sure the calves are doing well with whatever you give them. Um, but there, there is some work showing that calves consuming hay have improved weight gain, particularly through weaning. Um, we don't want them to be reducing starter intake when they start consuming hay or, or straw, so that's the important thing to watch for. But certainly providing straw, chopped straw as an alternative to chopped hay, you would be expected to have some similar effects. Um, in, in the studies I described, we specifically gave calves fairly low quality hay because we know they're getting a lot of the nutrients they need from the starter and it's more about the something to chew and something to interact with I think with the hay. Awesome well thank you very much.